Welcome to Expert Views on ADR Eva, a podcast about simplifying the traditional African method of selling disputes or the appropriate dispute resolution ADR in a bid to attract more users to settle their disputes or conflicts with ombuds, arbitration, mediation, collaborative law, restorative justice, early dispute resolution, negotiation, conciliation, and of course, early neutral evaluation. My name is Chima A. Munike, the marketing liaison of Ombuds Day 2024, American Bar Association Dispute Resolution, and the host of Expert Views on ADR Eva. I'm delighted to welcome Datuk Sandra Raja to the Eva Show. He is the current director of the Asian International Arbitration Center and president of the Asian Institute of Alternative Dispute Resolution. He is a certified international ADR practitioner and chartered arbitrator. He played an active role in transforming the AIAC into a sought after arbitration center in the Asian region, where the center's caseload grew massively from 22 arbitration cases in 2010 to an accumulative total of 2,761 arbitration adjudication and mediation cases in 2019. He wears many hats. I've left the links to his profile below. Welcome to the show, sir. Oh, sorry. It's such an honor to have you on the show. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to meet you and a privilege too. Oh, same here. So without further ado, the first question is, what is arbitration and its role in dispute resolution? Uh, arbitration is a, a method or mechanism of dispute resolution, uh, which involves uh, a neutral uh, deciding the legal rights of the parties uh, in accordance to uh, the law that is chosen and and according to the procedure that is actually decided uh, at the seat of the arbitration itself. Okay, uh, thank you so very much. So, has it enhanced access to justice in Asia? Say, say, say that again. I, I lost. Has you. arbitration enhanced access to justice in Asia? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, the the eight. Arbitration has actually uh, increased uh, justice, access to justice in okay. Asia because okay. uh, there are many reasons for it. Uh, first, first reason is that uh, there's great economic growth. There's great economic growth and then there is a lot of disputes coming out from it mm -hmm. and the only way of resolving uh, disputes involving transnational uh, situations okay. is by arbitration because of the universal uh, enforceability of the arbitral awards through the New York Convention. Convention. All right. Thank you so very much for that. So, what led to the birth of the Asian um, International Arbitration Center? Uh, actually, the we are part of uh, uh, an alliance. Uh, okay. Which was uh, uh, in um, uh, you know uh, the the Asian African Legal Consultative Organization uh, was set up as an international body representing over forty seven countries in Asia and Africa, and I think quite early in particularly in the in the seventies uh, there was a, a, a decision made at that time because arbitration was only available in, in the West, that means in London or in Europe. There was hardly any arbitration at that time in Asia and Africa. So the ALCO decided to set up a, a series of regional centers under the, its auspices hosted by host, uh, by countries. So uh, in in uh, in Asia, the first center that was set up was at that time known as the Regional Center for Arbitration Kuala Lumpur in 1978. So it became the genesis of what is AIAC today. Of course, there has been a number of we have been what over uh, 46 years in existence. Yeah. So we started off with as a regional center for arbitration. 
Kuala Lumpur in two, uh, 1978. Then in 2010, we became the KL Regional Center for Arbitration. In 2018, we became the Asian International Arbitration Center. It was just rebranded uh, to reflect its positioning yeah. in the center. There are many other centers in Asia. Uh, there are four more centers okay. in Asia. And so it's no longer, um, African is no longer included on the center. Uh, no, we, we have centers in Africa. Okay. Africa has three centers. One is called the Cairo Regional Center. Okay. The second is the Lagos Regional Center for Arbitration. And the third one is the Nairobi International Arbitration Center. Okay. Now all these serve Africa and beyond. Okay. So, uh, you know, and then in Asia, we have uh, uh, the, uh, the Asian International Arbitration Center based in Kuala Lumpur. Then we have the Tahiran International Arbitration Center based in Iran. Oh. And now uh, the Elko International Arbitration Center in Hong Kong. Oh. Okay. All right. Thank you so very much. So, at the exception of the um, center, what were the major challenges and um, or obstacles faced? Um, I, I think that, uh, we are a bit different from. There are three ways of setting up an arbitral center. The first one is uh, as controlled by government. That means you have a governmental body, yeah. and none. The government will have direct say it will be set up by the government. These are particularly true in, in China. All the arbitral positions are government control or city control or uh, provincial control. Okay. Then you have the second way of a private company uh, limited by grantee or some form of trust. Uh, that is in Hong Kong, in Singapore, even the LCIA, the ICC, they are all private companies or they are in a form of trust. And the third one which is actually an international body. The main obstacle, an uh, international body like Kuala Lumpur Regional, uh, like Asian International Arbitration Center, the main difficulty that Asian International Arbitration Center has is, is it is the nature of the of the of the setup itself. It is set up like the permanent court of arbitration in the Hague, oh. the PC, which is an international body hosted in the country. So that it really requires a different kind of arrangement, a transnational arrangement with the international body. For example, uh, then you have to give it a, 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 a personality which is a juridical personality. There has to be immunities and privileges. And I suppose the main obstacles faced in, in setting up new institutions are the same. Uh, for example, uh, what you need is infrastructure. You must have proper uh, facilities. You need to have uh, uh, people uh, who can run the place, and then you need to have products that you market your your services. And then I think the behind all this, the real obstacle is when you set up something in a developing country or in Asia or anywhere else yeah. is confidence. What is the confidence that people outside have in the institution? Hmm. Oh. So would you say that um, the same challenges that you faced, um, the center faced during um, the time it was, you know, um, created or um, about to be created, is it the same challenges that are faced um, um, in the present day? By the by, other arbitral institutions. It, it, I think it, uh, it, some of the challenges would be the same, but yeah. many of the challenges would depend on the particular environment. Uh, mm -hmm. For Africa, uh, I, I I can see my my colleagues would be actually let's say legislative content. Okay. Uh, what was the framework for the arbitration center itself, and what is the arbitral framework? regime, whether it's model law or not model law, mm -hmm. uh, I think Iran will have its own challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, and then some of the, you know, when we first started the center here yeah. Yeah. in uh, 1978, it was an outmoded uh, legal system. Mm -hmm. I mean, legal system, the arbitral system, uh, 
uh, in terms of the, we were using an English based 1950 Act. The model law only came in in 2005. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's that the laws and regulation guiding the AIAC as the, mod, um, the model law? Uh, no, the AIAC works under what is called a host country agreement. Okay. Uh, our constitution is based in on a treaty arrangement between uh, the Asian African Legal Consultative Organization okay. and uh, the the federal government in uh, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysian government. Okay. So in that agreement, the constitution and the obligations and the the, the responsibilities of both parties are set out. And this is how the center came about. And the center is recognized and set up by the Malaysian government. And but the structure is based on what is agreed between uh, these two bodies. Okay, okay. Thank you so very much. So what are your assessments of its use and accessibility um, to the general public? Uh, what is my assessment of uh, the uh, use yeah, of the center the, and AIC's accessibility? Is it uh, yes. to the public and implementation? Yes. Uh, I, I, I think it's uh, it is uh, it is the first international arbitral body that was established in this part of the world. Yeah. So it has been uh, providing various kinds of services, especially ADR services, and it has uh, it has uh, actually. Uh, uh, participated uh, in nation building, uh, particularly in Malaysia, in providing uh, efficient, uh, cost effective, and more importantly, uh, neutral dispute resolution, including uh, statutory adjudication. It is actually uh, uh, in in the center is the sole statutory adjudication body, uh, in uh, in in Malaysia. Uh, it, it, is in a, it is also in addition to the arbitral services that we offer, we also offer uh, domain name and uh, dispute resolution. Okay. We also offer uh, mediation. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you so very much. Because when you hear the name arbitration, you could just assume that it's only arbitration that is offered at the center. So I'm glad you, you pointed that out. Um, so thank you so very much. So is the center diversified? Uh, yep. Yeah, uh, what what is uh, the 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 whether the institute is diversified? The center is actually yes. very diverse in oh, the sense. Okay. Uh, I know because uh, it uh, while its objective started off with international arbitration, we have gone into other areas including domestic arbitration, domestic dispute resolution in terms of rights-based and interest-based, that is mediation and adjudication. So we also do capacity building. That means we train people. Uh, we also uh, increase awareness uh, in, uh, in the way, uh, uh, what is that, uh, 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 in people understanding what is the process so um, we we have many many uh, uh, things, but one of the other things is that because we are based in Malaysia, we also offer what is called the I arbitration rules, the Islamic rules. Oh wow! So so we have made uh, other other products also. For example, another product is uh, uh, the standard form of building contract. Okay. Uh, which is for uh, compliance. We, 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 we realize is that a lot of disputes come out from bad contracts. Mm -hmm. So we a set a form of building contract to overcome the normal places where disputes come about. And it is uh, available in on our website, free okay. downloadable. We relaunched it. We yeah. just launched also what is known as the Islamic standard form of building contract, which is Sharia compliant. Oh, okay. uh, so we are actually quite pioneering in our, our approach in many things. Oh, all right. Oh, well done. So looking at the Malaysian Bar Association and the Chinese Bar Association, um, what are the notable achievements of the intervention of um, the center? Uh, the, I think the first notable uh, achievement of the center is its premises. 
we have the best hearing premises and facilities in the world oh. next to the palace so we oh. have uh, one hearing rooms breakout rooms 12 breakout rooms a large uh, PCA standard, each six standard hearing rooms, uh, up to 60 persons it can handle. We have an arbitrator's lounge, we have an auditorium that is six, 200 people. We have a library, we have a cafe, dining areas. So it is a complete facility for uh, alternative dispute resolution uh, users. So uh, I think we are quite proud of it. It's a very large building. Uh, and then it is now uh, at about 70% usage. So we, we have a lot of takers. You know, I mean, our occupancy rate is quite good. Uh, I think that is one of the things that we are very proud of. Yeah. Second is that we have the, one of the best uh, 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 virtual hearing facilities, including a uh, COP recording system. Okay. That means we can actually record the entire uh, conversation. But um, we, we have actually followed the standards and we have alternative hearing venues for many institutions, including this uh, Court of Arbitration Sports CAS in the Switzerland. Okay. We are also the alternative hearing venue for uh, the PCA in The Hague, the mm -hmm. Permanent Court of Arbitration. We also we are the alternative hearing here, uh, venue for the World Bank, which is the ITSIC mechanism, IS uh, ITSIC uh, in, in Washington. Yeah. So we, we, we have many, many MOUs too. Uh, you know, we have, we, we enter into MOUs and we try to carry the work through. Uh, at, at the present moment, we have uh, 17 MOUs this year, yeah. last year, yeah. uh, with many institutions uh, ranging from Turkey, Istanbul, yeah. to, to China, to okay. India, to to states, United States, United Kingdom, uh, even even Russia. We just did one with Russia now. Oh, and what we do is that in these uh, collaborative agreements, we try to work with the, with the various institutions to promote arbitration, to promote dispute resolution, to promote our facilities, our ability to actually work together. Okay, thank you so very much. So um, how safe and confidential are practitioners' um, data? Uh, we we are very particular about uh, personal data protection, okay. and then confidentiality is one of the key if, uh, in, uh, items in our our arsenal of uh, of uh, of uh, dealing with uh, with parties and also uh, in handling uh, dispute resolution that yeah. comes under our our auspices. Uh, there is also a disclaimer that any person who is applying to be a panelist with AIAC stating that the information that we gather from assessing the eligibility, leading the verification and other things will be actually only for that purpose. Mm -hmm. It will not be used for any other purpose. Oh, okay. So we, we have consent normally yeah, uh, to store this information in a, in a, in a in a in a, in 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 a in a particular way, and uh, of course uh, the 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 person can call, withdraw the consent anytime the person mm -hmm. wants. Oh, okay. And so, what categories of um, persons um, can join um, the um, center or become a panelist? On the panel, you mean? Yes. What kind of people? Uh, we normally are quite uh, 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 selective uh, in the way that we uh, we choose our panelists. Uh, yeah. We expect a certain level of expertise, qualification, and experience. So uh, you will find that um, there will be a minimum requirement of a certain number of years, uh, having uh, 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 ten years of uh, ADR uh, practice. So uh, normally uh, we do not actually accept anybody less than that. So uh, to be on our panel is, is not easy, but once you are on it, you, it is recognized as uh, a, a mark of excellence. It doesn't mean that you will get work from us because uh, some of our panelists are from the United States. They're very, very far away. Although virtual hearing is now the way yes. for some of them, but it, it is more as a status symbol and a recognition of uh, of ability and experience. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Thank you so very much. So what is um, um, your recommendations um, to, for, for you to, for the center to improve in the nearest future? You know, what um, do you think would be the recommendations that you could give, you know, for that to happen in the nearest future? I, I think the you know uh, uh, the uh, the future of the center yeah. is dependent on uh, a, a few things. Uh, one is that there must be confidence in the center. Hmm. Uh, it, uh, no center can succeed uh, if there is no confidence. Confidence comes out from this level of trust of its uh, integrity, uh, the level of trust on its procedures, the level of trust. Uh, the way it actually is, uh, uh, handles uh, any dispute that comes to it. Uh, then the second thing is, of course, you must be adequately resourced. Uh, uh, poor funding, if you don't have enough things to market or to, 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 to promote uh, the use of the center uh, will be detrimental in the long run. Uh, the, the fourth thing, of course, the, the perceived independence of the centre is very, very important. Uh, so I think these are the real challenges many arbitral institutions face uh, because uh, resource, uh, doing the right products, having the right people. More importantly, also there is no interference uh, with its work and it is perceived to be independent of the, of the government, of the parties yeah. and anybody who will be interested in meddling in these affairs. Okay, thank you so very much. So what is your advice for the math advocacy of ADR? Uh, what is the advice for... for uh, math advocacy of ADR. Mass advocating of uh, ADR. I, I, I think that uh, it is actually now the trend uh, in the sense that uh, 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 a lot of uh, people are very interested in ADR as an alternative to the litigation system and, uh, it is, and it's actually a spreading uh, education for example in the universities yeah. uh, actually uh, even in uh, various institutions even in, under CPD which is continuing legal pro, pro, uh, continuing professional development uh, arrangements all emphasize on understanding the use of ADR and that actually improves accessibility. So once you are aware that you can use ADR as a method, then uh, the accessibility comes from structures that set out these possibilities. Okay, thank you so very much, sir. So um, one other question is, what kind of training do you, the center offer? What kind of training we offer? You know, we, we do the two main things. Uh, first thing that we offer uh, a lot of uh, awareness. That means we will have events on particular items, let's say third party funding, yeah. for example, or investment arbitration, yeah. or how to handle a hearing. That could be in the form of seminars, it could be form of a talk. But Actual training that we have done is, uh, let's say, a longer training, like mediation training, okay. where you become an accredited mediator or you do sports arbitration, but it will be a, 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 a structured course over, um, uh, let's say, a, a number of days, uh, with covering a number of uh, modules mm -hmm. and uh, trying to achieve certain competencies. So once you get that, then that is what we will then recognize you as a, a, a person who can do this thing. So uh, recently we empanel 100 over sports arbitrators oh. who attended the course uh, over many years. Oh. Uh, 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 but you know, what was, a, what was called a sports arbitration course, yes. which was held the center. So uh, we now set up the Asian Sports Tribunal Okay. And we have panel all these arbitrators, which include both local and international practitioners. Wow, awesome. Oh, okay, thank you so very much. I, um, of course, this is a master class. Thank you so very much for sharing your insights and perspectives and the learning you shared with us today. 
And of course, I believe that potential users would embrace or would embrace all you have stated here. And of course, opt for ADR via the arbitration um, international, Asian International um, Arbitration Center, AIAC, whenever the need arises. Thank you so very much, um, Dato, for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then uh, uh, goodbye. Oh, bye. Cheers. Have a lovely day. Bye. Take care.